the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Jim Gray, farmer's son, agribusiness owner, insurance agent. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today we'll travel to the campus of Virginia Tech to meet an award-winning farrier, Travis Burns. Then we'll talk about grubs when we join Mark Viette in the garden. And as always, we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. Governor Bob McDonnell recently announced the formal opening of a representative office in Europe focused to increase Virginia's agricultural and forestry experts to the region. The Commonwealth is believed to be the only state to currently have a dedicated trade office in the European market, one of the largest economic regions. Six of Virginia's top 15 agricultural export destinations include European countries covered by the new trade office. Virginia's European representatives have already started working on projects in the seafood, biofuels, specialty foods, and wine sectors. Overall, agricultural exports from Virginia reached just over $2.61 billion in 2012, an all-time high. While helping farmers and ranchers deal with climate change was a subject of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack's speech at the National Press Club. The USDA's Bob Ellison has more. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack told the National Press Club that USDA must work with farmers, ranchers, and foresters to help them adapt to climate challenges. First, USDA will now establish seven new regional climate hubs. These hubs will enable us to carry out regionally appropriate climate change risk and vulnerability assessments, get the data out to the field more quickly. Practically, these hubs will deal out advice to our farmers and forest owners on ways in which they can reduce on their lands the risks of a changing climate. Another effort will be for USDA agencies to give cover crop guidance based on local conditions to maximize the environmental benefits of farmland. The result is new guidance, a new model that uses local climate data, tillage management, and soil data to account for daily crop growth and the use of soil moisture. With this information, experts determined the latest possible time to terminate a cover crop, which will allow it to maximize carbon sequestration, while at the same time minimizing the risk to the cash crop yield. And finally, Vilsack announced the release of the free online carbon management and evaluation tool known as Comet Farm. It will help producers calculate how much carbon their conservation actions can remove from the atmosphere. For example, a producer planning to implement conservation tillage could estimate how that particular conservation practice would increase soil carbon and decrease emissions from his or her operation. Used in this way, Comet Farm will help producers reach decisions that will reduce their energy costs while building carbon stocks in their soil. It will also serve as a gateway for future efforts to help producers participate in voluntary carbon markets. Earlier this year, USDA released assessments on projected climate change effects on agriculture and forests. In Washington, D.C., for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'm Bob Ellison. Thank you, Bob. Well, regardless of the climate, deep-sea red crabs are now in Virginia. The fishing vessel, the Hannah Bowden, which was made famous by the motion picture The Perfect Storm, delivered the inaugural catch to L.D. Armory in Hampton on June 26. This is a joint venture between the Massachusetts-based Atlantic Red Crab Company and the Virginia-based L.D. Armory Company and Graham and Rollins. This month, they started delivering approximately 10,000 pounds of crabs on a weekly basis when the vessel relocated to Hampton. 
Atlantic deep sea red crabs are harvested off the coast between the Canadian border and North Carolina at a depth of 2,000 feet where the water temperature remains constant at approximately 38 degrees. Harvested year-round and known for their sweet, tasty meat and bright orange shell, the crabs are delivered dockside live and available to consumers at Graham and Rollins Seafood Market in Hampton. Now, the Virginia seafood industry is one of the oldest industries in the United States and one of the Commonwealth's largest. According to the Virginia Marine Products Board, Virginia is the nation's third largest producer of marine products, behind only Alaska and Louisiana, with total landings of almost 495 million pounds in 2011, the most recent year with full economic data. While bringing crabs in but trying to get rid of coyotes, Virginians losing livestock to nuisance wildlife animals like coyotes will soon have more help. Norm Hyde explains even the Virginia General Assembly recognized the need. Coyotes used to be a problem only for livestock producers in the western half of Virginia. At one time, coyote attacks were so bad there, many sheep producers went out of business. But two years ago, a cattle farmer in Gloucester County near the Chesapeake Bay woke up to find a dead calf in his fields. And it wasn't the first. It happened, uh, like I say, five times. And, uh, of course, it alarmed everybody around here, and, uh, and they was trying to get the camel animals up at night and everything, but uh, uh, the coyotes only work at night. Today, Charles Llewellyn's farm is quiet and peaceful, but it wasn't on that winter night in 2011 when four coyotes and a wild dog stampeded his herd. It took weeks of investigative work by the Gloucester County Animal Control Office and a specialist from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services Program to sort out the cause and destroy the predators. Meanwhile, despite insurance payments, Llewellyn was set back about $14,000. When you lose a total of 24, it takes time to raise them and uh, it really sets you back. I've had a problem trying to recover from it. You know, I thought it was going to put me under, but, uh, uh, but I'm ba I've been able to survive it. Unfortunately, Llewellyn's situation is no longer unique. After these attacks, the USDA and Virginia wildlife officials held a seminar in Gloucester County to discuss preventing coyote damage, and 300 people showed up. Farmers and pet owners all across eastern Virginia are reporting coyote losses, according to Scott Barris, Virginia Director of the Wildlife Services Program. In suburban and, and urban areas, we have coyotes. Coyotes are distributed throughout Virginia. And in those type of situations, you could see uh, coyotes actually taking small pets, such as, as cats or, or small dogs. So it's important not to leave those animals unattended. We've got a situation where we've actually got more wildlife and more people sharing the same land, and that's why we're seeing this increase in conflicts. Llewellyn says he heard coyotes howling just the other night, and he has farmer friends who bring their livestock in at night to prevent damage. Since his losses, Llewellyn has placed guard animals in his fields to protect his cattle, most of which are calves from a nearby dairy. This is advice he received from Wildlife Services and others. I have moved in a llama. Uh, I keep, uh, keep him in a field with uh, a group of animals, and I've got these uh, Sicilian donkeys. And uh, I use the female Sicilian donkey. Uh, they're very aggressive against a strange animal that comes in. But meanwhile, there's only so much ground that Virginia's one coyote specialist can cover each year. That's why Governor Bob McDonald suggested in the Virginia General Assembly just approved $75,000 in new state funding for a second animal damage specialist to help farmers and landowners in the eastern half of the state. Barris says farmers should take a comprehensive approach to preventing coyote damage, steps like better fencing and constantly changing your work patterns. But sometimes the predators just have to be removed. It's important to remember that predation is a behavioral event. It's not so much dependent on the number of coyotes that are out there as the specific coyotes that have learned to kill livestock. And so it's important to focus any effort on, on those individual animals. And those are all techniques that require a specialist. Llewellyn says the new help doesn't come a moment too soon for him. Just knowing the coyotes are still out there is nerve-wracking. They're here, and uh, we're just going to have to tighten up and, uh, you know, keep them under control. Llewellyn says he's asked local hunters to take coyotes whenever they see one. So far this year, four coyotes have been killed in his area alone. In Gloucester County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. Travis Burns is an award-winning farrier for the Virginia-Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. We'll hear about his interesting job when we visit him on Virginia Tech's campus. That's coming up next on Ag Insights.
the road today in Blacksburg, Virginia at Virginia Tech at the Virginia, Maryland Regional Veterinary Medicine Center. And I'm joined today by an award-winning farrier, Travis Burns. Travis, welcome to Virginia Farming. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. A farrier is more than a blacksmith. Explain that to me. Yeah, so there's, a, so there's very much a difference between a farrier and a blacksmith. So a farrier is a person responsible for the trimming and shoeing of a horse's foot or I guess donkeys, mules, so all equines. Um, so it is a little bit different. Blacksmiths typically are more ornamental. They do much more intricate blacksmithing work, like so the true metal working than a fairy does. So there's often some overlap between fairies and blacksmiths. So fairies, as they tend to get older and they tend to move further and further away from the actual horse, they tend to get into the ornamental blacksmithing or the hobby type stuff. But um, for the most part, a blacksmith does true metal work, where a farrier does some metal work, which would be the horseshoes itself, and then actually putting it on the horse's foot. So how did you get started in this profession? Uh, well, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, and my family ran a, uh, a trail guide service, so a riding stable in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And there, my uncles and father would shoe about 50 horses that they had on the farm there. And, uh, you know, growing up, that was a time when, uh, you know, you weren't allowed to necessarily be playing around the barn or goofing off. So it was a very serious time, and um, something about it just, you know, intrigued me, and I've been obsessed for, for most of my life, so... So you really picked up a lot from your dad? And uh, well, my dad's and my uncles, but one uncle in particular spent more time with me than, than the others. Um, he had the time to do that, and then I went to a fair school, and then I went to undergrad at uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, my ambition at that time was to go to, to vet school, but um, I quickly realized that I had one very specific interest, and, and that's what I've pursued. And So I did uh, or worked as an apprentice in Raleigh for a few people, and then I built kind of a small practice there. And then I moved um, to Northern Virginia to work for uh, another very well-respected fair that runs a multi-fair practice up in Leesburg. Um, and he's actually the official fair for the, the EMC or the Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center in Leesburg, which is okay. a satellite hospital to our campus here. Um, so I spent a few years there and then I came down here in uh, 2010. So describe a normal day for you here at the Veterinary Teaching Hospital at Tech. Our typical day revolves around seeing, um, you know, some horses here and some on the road. For the most part, we like to spend either at a complete day here or a complete day on the road. But today, for example, we're going to do um, a couple horses here that have some problems and then go to the, the riding program on campus. Um, I do have a, a fair intern that uh, we're responsible for teaching. so. We spend time forging or doing dissections. You know, she spends time going to class, things of that nature. Um, during the typical school year, um, I do have teaching responsibilities as well. Um, so I teach a, a course here to the third year veterinary students called equine podiatry with uh, another professor here, Dr. Scott Pleasant. Um, and so that's, you know, a class where there's built-in lecture time plus a huge chunk of lab time where the students actually spend time with, uh, you know, hands-on work, actually trimming, shoeing, going on shoes, things of that nature, just to become more experienced with the process of a farrier. So hopefully later on in their career, they can benefit from that, and work better and closer with a farrier. Horses are basically the same shape and size. So do their horseshoes really need to be different? So no two feet are exactly the same. Um, so they're, they're extremely different. And um, so they're, you know, and when they go into their conditions or if they have problems, that's when their feet really become odd or misshapen. Um, but for the most part, they are a pretty normal shape, but there are small intricacies that make them each unique. So basically, who are your clients? So my main clients are uh, mainly clients within the New River Valley or kind of uh, eastern West Virginia northern North Carolina and southwest Virginia down here. So most of our clients are made up of uh, referral cases from other vets and fairies in our area or in our region. And then we do a, do a few select performance horses. Um, so uh, some of our higher end show horses, particularly show jumpers. And then uh, we do the horses that are owned by Virginia Tech. So there are three are herds owned by Virginia Tech. So Virginia Tech has the riding program, which is owned by Animal and Poultry Science. And then they also own a small quarter horse breeding operation at Smithfield, which is 
just over there. And then um, the vet school actually owns about 20 horses as well. So why is it important to have horseshoes fit by hand? Okay, so, um, so horses' shoes are made by hand um, in special conditions or special times, but they're, the biggest difference between uh, a handmade shoe and a machine-made shoe um, is that the handmade shoe probably fits a little more exact. Um, so machine-made shoes come in various sizes and they have to be you know, altered to fit um, exactly. The biggest difference are the nail hole placement. So in a handmade shoe, you can place the nail holes wherever you want them or wherever you need them. In a machine-made shoe, they're in typically one spot. Um, they're typically one even depth in. Uh, however, on a normal horse's foot, the wall is thicker at the toe and thinner at the, the quarter. So it's nicer to be able to have the nails punched in you know, the very exact place rather than just having them pretty close. And by having the ability to hand make shoes, you can carry a much smaller inventory in your truck. And so by having the ability to hand make shoes, you don't have to carry every single possible shoe in the world that you might need. We talked about your clients earlier. Do the majority of your clients come to you here on campus or do you go to them? Majority of the work comes here. So really, um, we don't like to travel out because we don't like to compete with the local fairs. I mean, we very much want to build a, a referral practice here. Um, so for the most part, most horses do come here. We obviously, when I say on the road, I mean, we're talking a mile down the road to the Virginia Tech riding program, so not very far. All within the college. Uh-huh, yep. And so we do go to uh, a few select places, and, you know, if there were ever a case where, well, there have been cases where we go to other vet clinics and work alongside them when the horse can't be, be trailered in or they have some sort of problem where they just can't physically get here. But for the most part, we prefer to do everything in-house here. You are only one of 16 farriers in the United States to receive an associates from the Worshipful Farriers Association. Tell me about that. Well, it's, um, you know, it's an exam that you take. And so the Worshipful Company of Farriers is probably the oldest and most respected fair organization in the world. Um, so we, as Americans, think that they have probably one of the best fair training programs. And ultimately they have you know, very, very great fairs over there. And so it's a very well-respected organization. Um, so this particular exam, you have to first have a diploma from the Worshipful Company of Fairs, which for the candidates over there, they have to go to college and serve a four-year apprenticeship mm -hmm. to even sit for that exam. And then they have to take the exam. Uh, for us or overseas applicants, we have to um, have been a certified journeyman fair through the American Fairs Association. Um, and then have at least two years experience after gaining that, which is another exam that you take um, to be able to sit for the associate exam. And that exam consists of a very complex written exam. Um, um, they have a gait analysis part. Um, they have a portion where you go through an oral exam um, in front of two fairs and a, and a vet, or a, I believe it's actually a surgeon, and then you review radiographs with them, you review anatomy, things of that nature. You have to hand in a shoe board of you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 handmade therapeutic shoes. And then there's actually a practical portion where you have to shoe a horse with handmade shoes to their specifications and a shoe that they pick in a two hour time period. Wow, so they kind of throw you out there and yeah, to so see what you're made of, yeah, don't so they? Yeah, so it's a three day exam that's, that's very complex and then they actually um, they do have an additional modern materials exam where they ask you to, for example, rebuild wall with the glues or acrylics, uh, patch cracks, glue on shoes, things of that nature. So it's a, a very complex exam that's designed, hopefully, to uh, for the, the candidates that pass, must have a very well-rounded um, knowledge of the entire farrier trade. So Travis, you have so many accomplishments under your belt already. What's next for you? Uh, well, there is another exam with the Worshipful Company Affairs called the, the Fellowship of the Worshipful Company Affairs. And there's only four of those in the U.S. Um, and for that particular exam, you have to do a small research project and actually write a thesis and do a dissertation. Um, so I'd like to accomplish that in the next year or two years. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. So, well, congratulations on all your accomplishments and good luck in the future. And yeah. thank you so much yeah. for having us here today. Thank you very much. We'll be right back.
Grubs can eat at the roots of your lawn and turn it brown. With tips on how to determine the extent of the damage and treatment options, here's Mark Viet. As I was walking through the lawn, I noticed a few off-colored brown spots. Now these are spots that are not normal to appear in the lawn. And I also noticed where the tires from the mower had turned that the sod was turned up and rolled over. So I decided to go through and tug on the lawn. And what I found was grubs had cut the roots off right at the soil level, almost like a sod cutter where you can roll up the sod. One of the things that you have to determine is, is treatment if it's warranted. And how you can tell is if you have 10 or 12 of these grubs, which could be Japanese beetle grubs, per square foot is occurring in your lawn, then you need to treat your lawn. If you only have maybe two or three per square foot, you might want to wait till spring to treat with the long term treatment. But it's also easy just to pull up on the lawn and I'll show you how you can determine how many grubs you have. As I was pulling up the lawn, just like sod, you can just tug at it and pull it right off in many areas. And you can look at all the grubs that are present. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's even one here. And you can see they've completely severed the roots right from the soil. As you look real closely, you'll notice new white roots beginning to regrow. And also, as you're doing a count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that shows you, and that's less than a square foot, that means treatment is warranted. After a rain or after you irrigate the lawn, the lawn can reroot, but if you fail to irrigate the lawn or you're going through a drought period, the lawn can be killed and then you have to reseed it. So first, just go out, irrigate deeply. The lawn will reroot as you see here. You also notice that we have about 10 to 12 per square foot and it is important then that you treat. And uh, you know, companies make grub products that are grub proofing products. Some of those should be used in the spring and some can be used in the fall. And you have companies like Bonide, Bear Advance, you, you'll see where it says grub control. But be sure you use one that says recommended for late summer or early fall to control the grubs. Now these can be a variety of grubs, so we're not sure what type. You almost have to have the grub sent to a diagnostic lab to determine which one it is. You know, there's Japanese beetles, there's June beetles, there's other beetles that do affect and lay their eggs sometime in June, end of June, July, the eggs hatch out, they turn into larvae as you see here. And what happens is these grubs will winter over right here. They'll feed a little bit again in the spring and then they'll hatch out sometime in early summer. In addition to noticing the brown spots in your lawn, you also might notice animals digging in a lawn trying to feed on the grubs like possums and skunks. That's another sign that you might have a problem. But again, if you have 10 or 12 per square foot, it is recommended always according to label directions that you use a product to treat in the fall. If you miss the fall, you can use the spring products early in the season as the grubs start working up, getting ready to hatch out. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, the Virginia Board of Agriculture and Consumer Services meeting will be held July 29th at the Virginia Horse Center in Lexington. Items on the agenda include regulatory animal health programs and animal identification, an apiary inspection program, and a public hearing on the proposed regulation for enforcement of the noxious weed law. This meeting is open to the public. Well, that does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Nancy Asher, stable owner, visionary, agent of change. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know.